But again, hey everybody, my name is Alex Merced. I am the your 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 host here at Nelly Data Waves every Tuesday, same bad time, same bad place. And this week we're bringing you another installment of our super popular Apache Iceberg Office Hours, where you bring your Apache Iceberg questions and we'll bring our Apache Iceberg answers. But before we get started, uh, let's first uh, talk about uh, test drive. Bottom line is this, uh, the, the, the data lake house presents a lot of benefits. The idea of being able to have sort of the flexibility and cost point of a data lake with the performance and ease of use of a data warehouse. Okay, but the only really way to experience and kind of see what the benefits of this is, is to kind of get hands on and try it out yourself. So head over to Dremio.com, uh, right uh, at Dremio.com, and then you'll see the button to test drive Dremio. Uh, give it a shot, try it out, and, uh, you know, see what the, all the hype is about and get your hands on the data lake house with no obligations, no commitment, just an opportunity for you to try it out and see what it does. Okay. Also, again, uh, many of us here are working on Apache Iceberg, the definitive guide, a new book from O'Reilly, slated for release probably around February next year-ish. But um, bottom line, you can get yourself an early copy now, okay, um, by just scanning that QR code and get yourself an early copy of Apache Iceberg, the definitive guide, as we progress completing uh, chapter by chapter. It's going to be great content and uh, going to be a great reference for anyone just trying to, like, know where should I start? Where do I go? On all sorts of different topics, such as ingestion uh, and, and so forth when it comes to Apache Iceberg. So um, we'll be out there. Um, and then also we're gonna have so many more episodes with great content coming up over the next several months. So here's just a few of them. So next week, we're gonna be talking about how to modernize Hive uh, to the data lake house with Dremio and Apache Iceberg. So just talking about like, hey, you use Hive tables, um, you might be using a Hadoop cluster and you're thinking of, hey, I'd like to move to a data lake house using Apache Iceberg and with uh, the picture that Dremio plays in that. So that's next week. Uh, making the move, five factors to just consider when migrating from Hadoop to the data lake house. So you might have a Hadoop cluster and you're considering, should I migrate to a data lake house? Here we're going to, and that week we're gonna talk about sort of what are the things you should consider. Enabling data mesh with Dremio Arctic and data as code. Okay, so the idea here is when we're just talking about how you can use a tools like the uh, Dremio Arctic catalog and the data as code sort of paradigm of being able to like, do branching and merging and CICD and how that can help you better enable a, a data mesh. Okay, uh, and then episode 15 will be getting started with Dremio. That'll be on May 2nd, where we're gonna be going over sort of like, hey, you want, you want a data lake house. Uh, you know, how can you use Dremio as your platform to really make that a reality and how does it make it much easier to make that a reality? Uh, that'll be on episode 15 and episode 16 will be automatic data optimization with Dremio Arctic, talking about sort of how to take advantage of Dremio's feature of, of automated Apache Iceberg uh, table optimization and what it does and how it fits into your big picture. Okay. Um, with that, I just I also like to call attention to a few other things that are happening. So basically, uh, well, first let me just introduce our panel. So today we have again Apache Iceberg Office Hours. In the panel, we should have uh, Jason Hughes, Director of Product Management, myself, Developer Advocate, Dipankar Mazumdar, Developer Advocate, Ajant Thabat, uh, Open Source Software Engineer, Dmitry uh, Boloshkov, uh, Senior OSS Developer, Scott Cowell, Software Engineer, here to answer your Apache Iceberg questions. But one of the most exciting things that have con come up with Apache Iceberg in recent times is the release of 1.2, okay, and very soon uh, 1.21. And this added several things. Let me just point out some of the more sort of like key things to kind of keep in mind is one, uh, the second bullet point, added support for Delta Lake to Iceberg table conversion, okay? In order to discuss this more, we actually just released an article yesterday on the Dremio blog, which you can go to dremio.com slash blog uh, on this topic. So it talks about three different ways you can convert Delta Lake tables to Apache Iceberg tables. So that's at uh, dremio.com slash blog. Okay, other recent blogs we've released is uh, Depenka uh, released a blog on the new branching uh, and merging, uh, the new branching feature for branching tables. So again, uh, that's at the table level, different than uh, Project Nessie's catalog uh, level uh, versioning. Okay. And also there was an article on converting CSVs to Apache Icebergs. So a lot of great new Apache Iceberg content over there at dremio.com slash blog. Okay. But again, we see here a lot of stuff about like additional metrics. So 
um, you know, basically the ability to have additional scan and commit metrics over there through the catalog interface, uh, basically stuff about more statistics with the Puff and Spec, lots of really good stuff. A lot of these things, just collecting statistics is going to allow for more optimizations for uh, different tools that work with Iceberg and also just allow for more robust feature sets as, this, as the, the format evolves continues to evolve into sort of its super amazing state. Uh, but with that, if you have any questions about sort of your Apache Iceberg story, so basically questions about sort of what you, why you would use Apache Iceberg, or you have a specific situation where you're trying to use Apache Iceberg and you're looking for guidance, uh, now is the time to start putting those questions in the Q&A, and then we will answer them uh, as they come in. But we are here to help you uh, answer your Apache Iceberg questions. So I will stop sharing and then we'll start seeing the questions roll in and we'll work together to get them answered for you. And again, if you have any additional questions about Apache Iceberg, okay, feel free to put them in the Q and A. We'll begin answering those questions. Okay, in the meanwhile, um, Dipankar, uh, basically I think you're gonna be speaking soon about Apache Iceberg at, a, at an upcoming event. Uh, what is that event again? So yeah, so yeah, I think it's it's about like it's in the big data Toronto and like uh, we are speaking about like uh, you know the branching and tagging cap capabilities and how it compares with Nessie, and you know there are like uh, a lot of discussions around how we can make those uh, take those advantages of out of those new features, but also there are a lot of confusions in terms of like how they compare in terms of catalog level things and stuff. So I think that's going to be like the next topic. I see a hand from Sharon. Uh, I think they have to re put it in the Q and A. Um, I don't know. Okay, I, we have a question. Okay, so our first question we're gonna have from uh, Taro Panen. Uh, how do you handle replication failures on AWS S3 with Iceberg? Say you commit a transaction. The data and the metadata files are successfully written to one region. The commit succeeds. The metadata file location is updated in the Metastore and then your AWS S3 fails to replicate the new files in other regions. What happens to your Iceberg table? Okay, does anyone have any uh, thoughts on this, this AWS specific issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, I can like I'm my understanding is that that should be transparent to us. Uh, like I'd have to double check in terms of our region handling, but for the most part, the 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 S3 paths should be like at least in the iceberg metadata has no information about what region those you know the, those buckets are in. Um, so my assumption is it would just be a, a performance hit where you'd, you'd be going cross region to get the data. And then if the replication succeeded, then you'd no longer have that uh, kind of degradation, but we can follow up on that to confirm if that's the case. Okay, yeah, sounds I, good. I also Go for it. think the same. And, and his problem can be the same problem with the parquet tables as well. Like uh, if the parquet data files are not rep replicated in other region, what happens? So yeah, I think it's a common problem. Got it, got it, okay. So, um, and it's just a space to summarize. I'll just might mark this as answered live. And then we have another question here coming in from Sharon Kesselman. What is the best way to get data into Dremio? after an AWS ETL glue job. There are three schemas that I need to have updated simultaneously into three VDSs. Now, my assumption would be is that if you're basically ETLing the job into AWS glue, and I'm assuming that you're just landing an Apache iceberg table into the AWS glue catalog, essentially any, any views that are derived from that table based on whatever their sync frequency is should sort of well, I mean, there's basically the VDS should automatically reflect because they're just going to all, at the end of the day, be querying that same data set. So when that VDS is brought up, it's just going to query that same table and be generated based on that. So unless there's like conflicting schema changes or whatnot, um, should automatically work fine. I mean, in the sense that like if the original table changed in a way that the SQL that generates the VDS might have an issue, but it should automatically, I think it should automatically update. I don't know if anyone else has any other insight on that specific issue? Yeah, and in terms of the consistency, uh, one thing you could do is if you, depending on your metadata refresh interval, though, if, I guess it depends if these are, if these are just kind of flat parquet, the regular parquet tables and glue versus iceberg. Like using iceberg, you'll have 
an easier time maintaining cross table consistency. Uh, okay, so so if it is iceberg, essentially with Dremio, what we'll do is on when we when metadata refresh is performed, we'll go look at that iceberg table and cache the latest snapshot at that point in time, and then we'll continue to use that snapshot for all queries until the next refresh on that table, the metadata refresh. So by tuning your metadata refresh intervals, you can control when Dremio will, will see new versions of tables. And that way, if you are managing when, snap, when new snapshots for the a set of tables, say your three tables are going into glue, then you could coordinate the metadata refresh on those three tables such that you're you're getting a more consistent view of things. Though I think it it's still maybe a little awkward. Uh, I think like Arctic is is a messy or something that probably solved that sort of scenario a lot better, like in a more fundamental way. Yes, yes, exactly. And I think we cannot avoid talking about Arctic uh, and data as code, which is powered by, by Project Nessie open source. And specifically in the area where we're talking about consistency across different areas of, of the data, that becomes very important. So essentially, uh, Nessie enables tracking data changes the same way you track your source changes in Git, where basically you, you can stage your updates on a branch, do all your changes, let the jobs run. Once you're happy with the data, you do one final merge into main, at which time main gets all of the updates in one go, right? That, that's the idea. This is how Nessie works and, and this is how Arctic, uh, by virtue of using Nessie, it will work the same way. And then one follow up in terms of uh, how you can tune the metadata refreshes. One, one way where you can have complete control is if you go into your glue source settings, there should be uh, a metadata tab where you can set the, uh, the metadata refresh and metadata expiry intervals. And there you could, you could essentially set the, the automatic metadata ref refresh to, I think, never. I think there's an option where you can essentially turn it off and then you could manually issue uh refresh metadata or yeah like i think it's alter table refresh metadata for each table you can basically force refresh it when when at the at the time you want to do it so you could basically go run your glue etl jobs then once those are done go issue manual refreshes on the tables impacted and that way you'd have complete control. The downside is you have to go do some extra manual steps. And that's kind of the trade-off there. Awesome. And now on that note, like, like you mentioned that you're not using a share and you're not using Arctic yet in your question, but, but you have heard of it. Now that means in the future, you might want to switch over to Dremio Arctic as your catalog. And that means you'd have to move all those tables from your AWS glue catalog over there to the Dremio Arctic catalog. Now, Ajanta, I think you're working on a CLI tool that's, that would help with this specific situation. I don't know if you want to tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm actually working. Uh, act, act, actually, in the in the uh, iceberg, the, the the user wants to move away from one catalog to other. For example, they were using a Hadoop catalog, and they got to know that it is not uh, re recommended in the production, so they want to move to some cloud-based catalogs. So yeah, uh, so we do require some tool which is going to do a, a help migration of an ex existing table from one catalog to another. So I am working on it. We, we have discussed this with Iceberg community and the com 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 community has mentioned that they don't want to maintain a tool within Iceberg. It is because they want to focus on the spec and other areas of Iceberg, not, not, not on the catalog level internals. So I'm working on an open source tool. It is almost done uh, recently last uh, week. I, I have tested it with uh, Glue, uh, uh, JDBC, and uh, other catalogs as well. It it works fine. So yeah, uh, soon maybe by 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 by, by, by next meeting we can have the tool or a blog out soon. 
That's cool. And the method, like the actual like register table method, that's already part of the catalog interface, right? So if someone could do it, like they could go in Java and, and manually do it. Yeah, they can do it, but still it is messy. Like for example, we, we, we were planning to migrate from one catalog to other, the other catalog may not, may, 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 may not have that namespace. So for example, I have a table with a namespace X here in the source catalog, but we may not have that namespace in the target catalog. At, at that time, we have to manually create the namespace. And yeah, so it requires a lot of effort if you want to do from Java API. So this tool will be really handy. Okay, really sweet. I'm really looking forward to that. That's going to be really exciting because I know that is definitely a question that comes up a lot in the sense that, you know, people may, may be moving to Iceberg directly from like an on-prem setup. So they're starting off with like a Hive as their catalog, but they do eventually want to migrate yeah. to something like either like a, a Arctic or a Glue or something like that. Um, cool. And uh, Dimitri, uh, you work on uh, uh, particularly like Nessie and Arctic. What's, what's kind of new in that space? Yeah, Project Nessie is actually evolving pretty pretty quickly now. API v2 is, uh, has been released. It's been out for a few months now. Still, it's still in beta, but uh, we're moving towards uh, polishing it, finalizing it, and uh, actually making it uh, available as a, as a fully supported uh, API version. So there's uh, been a new model optimized for storage. Uh, we've seen some nice performance improvements with that certainly improves validation, improves uh, consistency checks. Lots of cool stuff happening. Yeah. Okay, that's very as exciting. You can, as you can see maybe by, by the cadence of releases where we used to be released every month, maybe now we're releasing every week, sometimes twice a week. You know, I, I've definitely noticed. So there's definitely like right now, the, the, the Project Nessie uh, development is hot and exciting. So if you haven't already liked that repo or started that repo, head over to uh, github.com and, and go start the Project Nessie repo. Uh, it's very cool. It's very cool. Uh, and then Scott, okay, um, you work with like a lot of the sort of the Dremio iceberg stuff. So what's kind of kind of new in that space? Yeah, so there's a number of things we're we're looking at right now, uh, kind of within the engine. So one of the big features we've been working on is copy into, uh, and there we've already shipped uh, kind of a initial version of that, but we're we're working on enhancements to like improved error handling and that a uh, number of other things. We've got, we've got a pretty extensive roadmap in terms of where we want to want to take that feature. Cause that's kind of a core to, to getting, getting data is like in text and JSON, maybe like in the future parquet possibly as well. Uh, getting those into iceberg tables uh, within using Dremio. Uh, and then other, other things we're looking at is uh just iterating on our DML support, both from performance improvement standpoints, and then there's additional capabilities we want to introduce. Uh, so, you know, some of them are, are a little longer on the roadmap, but things like uh, merge on read for, for DML. Uh, so that, that kind of goes into the kind of the performance front. And I think there, there's been, a, I think we have a lot of content out there in terms of the copy on write, merge on read, trade offs, and whatnot. That if people are interested in that, they could uh, they can go take a look at that. Um, and uh, I think in the the Apache one point two, there I think there was some mention of and some improvements around stats handling, and whatever. But there's within the iceberg community, there's a lot of momentum around uh, improved statistics attached to iceberg tables and different engines are, are kind of doing different initiatives around that. So, uh, you know, we're part of that in terms of, uh, Ajantha has been, uh, or I think Ajantha, is that you with the partition stats? Yeah, yeah, it's me. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's something where in the future, we're, we're looking to kind of take some of our private implementations of partition stats, get that held in the community, but, there's some other things where we want to take some of the other community initiatives around stats and, and build that deeper into the Dremio engine where we, we've got some basics there, but there, there's a lot of, of things we'd like to do in the future. So that is super cool. Uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of things going on uh, behind the scenes. Here. Yep. And again, if you've raised your hand, uh, please uh, put your question in the Q&A. Uh, oh, here we go. We do got a couple more questions, but just one final note before 
I, I read the next question, is that um, that copy into command is super cool. If you check out that new uh, CSV into iceberg article, it does talk about that copy into command if you want to see more about that. Uh, ah, very cool about being uh, able to do that about metadata refreshes. Thanks. And then here's another question. Um, Dremio can't currently read iceberg tables I have in, a cur in the curated bucket. I get errors like data set not found. I can view everywhere else. And using, Dremio, using the Dremio S3 connection just cannot through the data lake catalog. Any thoughts? And so basically they can read the table via like S3 where they promote the folder. They, this is, I guess it's not appearing in the AWS glue catalog. Um, I mean, one reason I can think off the top of my head that happens to me sometimes is that when I add an AWS glue catalog, you do have to specify the region for each time you add the glue, your, glue, your glue account. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll accidentally specify Oregon, but all my tables are in uh, US East one. So then what happens, I, I think I was like, where did all my tables go? And it's, I just had to re-add it again with the right region. So that I would add, I would add that glue catalog each time for each region you have tables in. That might be one possible uh, reason. Okay, that's not it. Okay. Um, anyone else have any other thoughts on that? What that be? We might have to take a look at the specifics. So you might have to reach out to us afterwards and we can see if we can take a deeper look at what might be going on in your specific situation. Um, if you're if you're working with a particular like uh, SA uh, AE, see if uh, reach out to them and they can reach out to us and we can triage that, see what the deal is. Um, okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, yeah, because. Aside from that, aside from the issue I mentioned before, that's the only time I ever had an issue where like my table didn't pop up. But it was just I just set the wrong region. Um, okay, cool, 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 cool. And then again, uh, lots of really great blogs over there at Dremio.com. So that's going to include the copy one where you talk about copy into. Copy into is really cool. Just to kind of understand some of the benefits of copy into as it is right now is that before the copy into command was released, if I wanted to turn a CSV into an iceberg table, I could do that. I could use like a CTAS or I could use like an insert into a query. The problem is, is like the CSV, when you first add it as a source in Dremio, it's gonna just treat every column as like a string column. The nice thing is like when I do copy into, it'll take a look at the schema of the target iceberg table and just automatically make all those sort of force, those type conversions for you. So it makes it much easier to, to turn those CSV files or those JSON files, which it currently supports into, into iceberg tables. So definitely something uh, worth looking into. And there will be a follow-up article about converting JSON into iceberg that should come out in the coming weeks. Uh, and then the Pankar, you came up with a, a article about branching and tagging in uh, Iceberg. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what you wrote about in the article, a little bit about the feature? Um, and uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it was more about exploring the features. Like, you know, people have been waiting for this, like at least in some communities that I see that, you know, they are looking for this feature specifically natively with Iceberg tables. So I think the whole point was to like, you know, show people the syntax and everything. Uh, but also like I point out two important, like, beginner level use cases, which is like usually that you kind of see with, for example, like uh, reproducing your machine learning models based on a particular version of that particular uh, commit that you made on the iceberg table, right? So now you have the ability to basically, let's say, hey, this is my commit and I can tag this particular version as a particular, you know, commit. And then I can use it directly with my, like, you know, Spark ML or something like that and reproduce my models. But also it's also really good for analysis, right? Any kind of like ad hoc analysis, like where you're like, you know, for example, you have certain uh, data that you want to only specifically focus on GDPR related stuff, right? So those kind of stuff are really, really important that brings out, I guess branch is a really good way to like, now with Spark, you can write out to a particular branch, right? So now that gives us the ability to like, you know, put out any kind of historical data that I want to store it uh, for a longer period of time, like based on a certain quarter or a certain financial year. So uh, I think those kind of things are the one that I kind of talk about and also show a direction towards how it differs from, uh, you know, in general, having a uh, branching and tagging at the catalog level. Cool. And I just like to expand a little bit about that. There are like, there's some key differences when you think about like, uh, like branching at the table level and the catalog level. And one of probably one of the biggest ones is like the idea of like multi-table commits. Like basically if I branch two tables, I then have to then go back and reconcile those snapshots afterwards, each one individually. So you don't necessarily get that same multi-table consistency as if you would, if you branch your catalog, made all your changes to your tables and then merged the catalog, which was what like Dremio Arctic and Project Nessie bring to the table. Um, and then the, like, I, I know I got this question a few times last week at, um, at Data Council 
uh, where people, because basically uh, one of the other vendors over there at Data Council was like FS, and what they do is they do uh, they do similar thing like branching, tagging, uh, but they do that at the file level. So you're technically like you're branching your file system. Now, one thing you have to kind of take into consideration if you're ever for when it comes to iceberg, and which is why like a Dremio Arc, an Arctic catalog makes a lot more sense for uh, an iceberg type situation, is that the location of your catalog isn't always the same location as your files. So if you roll back your file system, you're not necessarily rolling back your catalog. And then you end up having a mismatch between the two. So especially with, with, with like iceberg tables where like that catalog plays such a big role, um, you know, you gotta be very careful with that. So you, oftentimes having the versioning at the catalog level really helps reconcile, hey, this is my list of tables. These are the files they're pointing to. Um, it's just gonna be a much sort of uh, safer route, partic again, particularly in the iceberg story. Um, but so yeah, so just a quick roundabout of a versioning there, although we'll probably be doing some more content around sort of like these different levels of versioning and the pros and cons in the future. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and then as far as like a lot of the stuff that's on sort of the iceberg roadmap, is there anything that like um, you're all particularly interested in seeing that's not necessarily implemented in iceberg yet, but you know, it's like, hey, this has been in discussion, it's, it's, it's being worked on. Um, but, and when it's there, it's gonna be super cool. I think it is iceberg, iceberg views. Yeah, the, hmm? the a lot of uh, discussion is going on views. It is uh, if uh, we, we because we require a common view, common standardized view format, which is going to be read by all the engines. So which can be really really helpful. Right now, the views written by one engine cannot be read by other. So and it also has some quite challenges like the uh, equal syntax for each engine are different. So we might we might we might have to standardize it or use some translators there. Yeah. So I'm re really looking forward to how the things will uh, run out in the com com community regarding iceberg views. Got it. And now, how would that potentially mechanically work? Would 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 you be like tracking like sort of like a sub snapshot kind of thing? So basically, like let's say I created a view that was just like two partitions. It would create like a, like a sub snapshot that I could query that just are the files for those that section. Is it that kind of thing? It will be like a uh, one more. Uh, table so uh, and mm -hmm. it will be ma materialized views also they are planning the views are two kinds of views one is just for a query so instead of a, a big query i can just use a view so it can uh, it can use it as a template there. Uh, other one will be the ma materialized view like uh, instead of computing d d data after querying we can have a pre we can have a pre -com 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 computed data which can speed up query a lot so Got it. Okay. So, okay. I, I think I, I, I can kind of imagine, I can kind of imagine that implementation. Okay, cool. That is really cool. I, I, I am now very excited for that. Um, cool. And then um, any other sort of interesting iceberg tidbits that anyone would like to uh, expound on or talk on uh, before we, we, as we, we, as we get closer to landing the plane? As you mentioned, uh, Alex, uh, there are multi-table transactions, right? So there is there is a discussion going on in the community about implementing them natively in Iceberg, but this is very early still. Yeah, just to, just to put it in context, so Nessie right now allows you to kind of uh, implement multi-table transactions by virtue of creating a branch and staging your commits in the branch and then merging it. The work that is going on on the Iceberg side it's more is more native to Iceberg, so you you should be able to commit all of changes at once, as far as Iceberg is concerned. And of course, Nessie is going to be implementing it as well, with uh, Got it. Now, with, with version tracking. What would be the mechanics on that? What is it? Is it like just like basically? Is it more like a begin transaction and transaction type style kind of thing? Pretty much, pretty much, yes. At the catalog level. Got it. Okay. So okay. And oh, so it's still, it, so would still be, early, would be... early in discussion. So I don't think there there is any kind of like uh, firm Sorry. firm yeah firm expectation. But generally speaking, it's like begin transaction to your changes and transaction. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, I was like thinking about that. I was like, I could see how you can get to at in the, well, I guess if you're changing the catalog spec, then okay. I, I never mind. I see. I see. It makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is going to be uh, at least at least the discussion right now is going in, uh, in the way it, it is going to be at the catalog level. Right. Got it. Okay. No, no, then then that makes perfect sense. Okay. 
because at first I was imagining like some sort of like table level thing where you, you, you do, you just like batch the transactions, but then what would happen is if you wanted to do like a rollback, you wouldn't be able to necessarily do like a group rollback, but if you're doing it at the catalog level, then that makes sense. You can, you can go both directions. Yeah, um, roll, roll, roll back technically is still up in the air. I don't think it is in the first revision of the proposal. Mm -hmm. So essentially if your transaction fails, rollback is up to you. You have to clean up after your failed uh, files. But we'll, see, it, we'll see. Got it. Okay. So I know. I, no, I, mean, again, I mean, your data is not corrupted. It's just that. Clean oh, up. no. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You have to do it one by one instead yeah, of doing exactly. it as a group. Yeah. Yeah. So, bottom line is another nice reason to have Dremio, the Dremio Arctic or Project Nessie catalog is not just multi table committing multi table transactions, but it's rolling back transactions across multiple tables, just uh, as, 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 a, as an aside. Um, cool. And I, I will leave it off to any final thoughts or any final questions. So if anyone's got any remaining questions, do ask away. If anyone's got any remaining thoughts, feel free to use, feel free to just uh, say say what you want to say. And um, this has been a fun, fun uh, Apache Iceberg office hours. We've gotten to really kind of explore a little bit about what's going on in the Apache Iceberg world from the point of view of the Apache Iceberg core, uh, Project Nessie, Dremio. So this has, been a, this has been definitely a good time, but I'll give a moment for anyone to ask any remaining questions and say any remaining words. Okay, I think that um, that will then kind of start to start landing the plane. Again, uh, we want to remind everyone that all these episodes are also available as a podcast. So if you haven't actually subscribed to Gnarly Data Waves on Spotify or iTunes so that we can listen to these episodes again, I highly recommend doing so. Also, you can get them on the uh, Dremio YouTube channel at, drem at youtube.com slash Dremio so that way you can always watch these whenever you want and share them with others. And hey, we got another question. If you want to go into more detail on external reflections, oh, and when they should be used, uh, or point to documentation, I didn't find too much online. This is a very interesting topic. Um, did anyone else want to first talk about external reflections? Okay, I mean, I'm not an. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm. Uh, I am an expert uh, on external reflections, but the basic idea is this is a summary, and I, I'll see if I can find some more documentation from you. So again, reach out to us after this, and we'll get you some more detail. But for those who are not familiar with like what external reflections is, first, let's talk about what reflections are. So in Dremio, you have reflections. You're able to kind of turn on this feature for any table that you have. And essentially what it's going to do, it's going to create sort of like these um, iceberg-based material, iceberg materializations of your table. Not necessarily of the entire table. Depending on how you set it up, it could be little pieces of your table that are reusable, composable throughout your different data sets. Um, so you get a lot of cool, you get a lot of bang for your buck on, on the materialization side. Um, that's great, but sometimes what people want to do is that they may want to create their own sort of custom physical piece that they want to accelerate their query on. So that's what these external reflections are. So essentially you're creating your own physical thing or your own physical table outside that Dremio didn't create. And you're saying, hey, use this when you're doing your reflections thing and optimizing your queries. Um, there are... There are some things you have to be careful with there. I was just reading a document on this the other day, so I need to go back and reference that. And I, again, I, I will I will get you a list of that. Uh, that actually might be a good blog topic. Um, but um, that is essentially the summary of the issue. But again, because it's external to Dremio, again, there's certain situations where it, it, it it's going to make more sense, and there's going to be certain situations where um, there's going to be certain gotchas if you're not careful. Um, again, the finer details are escaping me at the moment, but again, I have I, I have read a document that kind of go that 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 has all those details, and I'll see if I can uh, boil that down for you and get that to you. Um, did anyone else have anything they want to say on external reflections? Yeah, yeah, Alex. Thanks. So if I if I may add something, if from my point of view, like the Nessie perspective on this, is that I can see that managing external reflections in a, in a data is code way can be actually quite beneficial because, say for example, you have a piece of data that that is your main data, and then you have your reflection that you, you manage on your uh, on your own, right? And you obviously want to maintain consistency between these two pieces of data, right? So whenever you, your main body of, of uh, bits change, then you want to update your reflection, and you want to commit or kind of make it available uh, together, right? So you don't kind of, the reflection does not lag behind. So, and data as code concepts will will come in handy with that, I think. I'm not sure how would it, how would it actually integrates with Dremio if 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 we're talking about Dremio engines, but hypothetically, I think it, it can be very very handy in that regard. 
a hundred percent. And then just to answer the, the last question, which is like how they kind of reach out to us. All of us are on LinkedIn and all of us are, I think are all of us are on the Apache iceberg Slack. Is anyone here not on the Apache iceberg Slack? Yeah. Okay. So basically those are two, two avenues by which you can, you can track us down. Um, I'm, you know, there and I'm usually pretty quick to respond. So again, if you just need some follow-up documentation from some of the questions here, just, just reach out and I'll get that stuff to you. Um, and with that, again, next week, we're gonna be talking about migration from Hive to Iceberg. So not only are we talk about how to do it, but we're gonna just talk about sort of like the whys and also just like the grander architectural like journey. So basically talking about like, hey, this is what your architecture is now. You know, you're using like Hive, Hadoop, Okay, you might be doing your queries with like something like Impala or Drill and talking about how do you get that journey to something that's gonna be more open, more faster and a lot, lot less uh, maintenance. So uh, don't forget to, mi don't miss that next week. Um, and uh, otherwise, again, every Tuesday, same bad time, same bad place. We'll be telling you some great information about the Data Lake House and getting you, um, helping you on your Data Lake House journey. Um, but with that, I would like to thank our panel once again for joining us for Apache Office Hours. Again, we'll be doing this like generally every six-ish weeks. Um, so that would make the next one probably early June for Apache Iceberg Office Hours. Um, but otherwise, I will see you all on the next Gnarly Data Waves. Again, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, have a wonderful day.